Thank you. Good morning. It is great to be with you this morning. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I really appreciate that and uh, your friendship as well. And uh, I've been really welcomed uh, this morning. And so if you are a guest, I hope you have felt welcomed as well. And so I want to welcome you all here in the room. And to those of you watching online, we're so glad that you're here today. Well, when I was in my mid-30s, I was out of shape and I decided to do something about it. So I signed up for the mini marathon. And uh, let's just say I was the guy that uh, for breakfast would go to Speedway gas station every morning. I would get a 32-ounce Coke, had to be a styrofoam cup, and I would get two breakfast tornadoes. You know those things that just roll on? The, some of you are already like wincing. Yes, those things that would roll on the grill next to the hot dogs. Like they would roll on there for days waiting for guys like me. Well, that was me. So I was out of shape. I needed to do something about it. So I got a gym membership and uh, I started working out. I started to eat better. And then, you know what? I started running. And I realized, I don't know if I really like running. <laughs> I have flat feet, bone spurs, and, uh, you know, 13.1 miles is a long ways to run. But I kept running, I kept training, and I finally got to the point where it was May. And May is when the Indianapolis Mini Marathon is. And so my wife and my kids, my mom and dad and sister all came to support me. And I'll never forget that feeling of being in this huge crowd, my racing bib on, and this giant mob making its way through the starting gate. And it hit me, I'm doing it. I am running this race, and it felt so exciting to be a part of it. And one of the things that I loved was that there were people cheering on the sidelines. And if you've ever run the mini, you know that there are bands playing, there are kids holding posters up, there are people serving, you know, they're handing out water and Gatorade, and it was awesome. And, and I thought to myself, okay, I can do this. Well, miles two through four went great. I was on pace with my goal. And then miles five and six came, and I still felt good. We then went into the track, and I got to see the big jumbotron. And as I make my way around it, I'm looking at the screen, and there's people already finishing the race, which was a little discouraging. <laughs> I had a long ways to go yet. And so I make my way outside of the track. And the crowd started to disappear. There was no one cheering, and the pain was getting more severe, and I was dehydrated, and my thoughts turned to quitting. Mile number 11 was a crossroads, you see. I had never trained past mile 10. I actually didn't know if I could run 13.1 miles. So depth, doubt crept in, and, and it made the pain scream louder. Mile marker 11. It was an unknown for me. And maybe some of you are here today in a season of life that you never thought you would be in. Maybe some of you watching online or listening to this, you never thought this season of life would come at you the way it has. I call it a valley. A valley is a very difficult season of life. A valley can be navigating down a road of losing a loved one. A valley can be a road of suffering. A valley can be a road of pain, hurt, and discouragement. And I've been navigating some of the hardest seasons of my life the last nine years. It started with the diagnosis of my dad and losing him to brain cancer. I've been in two car accidents and dealt with concussions and long recoveries. We've experienced church hurt, unemployment, living in the basement of some friends for six months, a pandemic, and dealing with such hurt and discouragement that I question if God truly cared. Yet what if I told you that the only way out of the valley is through it? What if I told you that the only way to finish the race is to keep running even when everything in you says to quit and to give up? What if I told you that my life has been transformed by the faithfulness of God through the valley? 
You see, in the Indy Half Marathon, I made the decision not to give up. And pretty soon, the crowd started to reappear again at mile marker 12. They were cheering, on, cheering me on, and, and I realized I had one mile left. And the last quarter mile turned from pain and struggle to joy and excitement. And I could see the finish line. And when I came across that line, I was so excited and, and flooded with emotions that I did it. I accomplished my goal. And there I am running, and I've never run a mini marathon again. But, <laughs> but I did it. I, I, I accomplished one, right? Right? And this life is like a race. And just like running past mile marker 11, we go into valleys and seasons of life that we've never had to endure before. We're running into the unknown, down roads we've never been, seasons of hardship, loss, grief, disappointment, and discouragement. And maybe that's some of you here today. You're down a road that you've never been on, and, and it's confusing it just dis disorients you. You have doubts if God cares. You've questioned everything that you've ever known. And a verse for me that meant a lot during my valleys came from Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. And, and if you have um, your Bible, you can turn to Proverbs 3. It's going to be up on the screen. But this really would be a good verse this week just to come back to and meditate on. This is from the message version, and this is what it says. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. And so often, we don't run to God we just find ourselves running alone. And the title of this message is Walking Through the Valleys. And in most cases, we think about walking through the darkest days of our lives alone. We think how difficult those days can be. However, what I learned is that I didn't walk through the valley alone. Even when I didn't recognize God at work or what he was doing, I discovered that God was right there with me. Years ago, I was a groomsman at a wedding of two college friends. And the wedding was in Iowa during the summer. And all of us, you know, living in the Midwest, we know how hot the summers can get, and especially around cornfields. And I had a friend from the Midwest that said, uh, the corn sweats are the real deal. Something about being around cornfields seems to escalate the humidity. So the wedding was outside under a tent, and it was a beautiful setting. But did I mention... It was hot and humid, all right? You might see where this is going. And uh, the wedding started with the bridesmaids coming down and going to one side and the groomsmen to the other. And I looked over at my friend who was the groom and he was beaming with excitement as he saw his bride come down. And so the wedding started out and everything was, it was going great. But that excitement turned to concern quickly as the maid of honor, the bride's sister, passed out, just drops. So everybody kind of rushes to her to make sure that she's okay. And uh, with the heat and not eating breakfast, we found out she passed out. So they escort her back to the house. We got back in place. And about five minutes later, another bridesmaid passes out. Everybody rushes to her. They make sure she's okay. They escort her back to the house. And you guys, I started to feel lightheaded. I thought, I'm going to be the third person that passes out at this wedding, which might be an Iowa record. I'm not sure. I look at um, the bride, and she is over this chaos. She is ready for this wedding to be over, and I was right there with her. I was like, can we just skip over some stuff? Can we get to the end? Can we call them husband and wife before more bodies hit the floor? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, so we finally got them married, and uh, I think that's so true with being in the valley. We want this to be over. 
We want this to be over. Lord, can you just please end this before there's more chaos? Can you end this before there's more hurt and pain in my life? Can you escort me to safety? And, and I think we look at the valleys in front of us and they look unwinnable. We look at the battles we are in and we only see hopelessness, fear, chaos, and we're in panic mode. And God wants to remind you today that he's fighting your battles. And the story of Moses that we're going to look at this morning is about a guy who faced his own mountains and valleys in life. As a Hebrew who grew up in the palace with all the luxuries of being royalty in Egypt, he might have been a know-it-all kind of guy. He saw an Egyptian guard beating a Hebrew slave one day and took his own vengeance and killed the guard. And in fear of retribution, he ran away. He became a shepherd for his father-in-law and tended sheep. One day the Lord appeared to him in a fiery bush and called him to go back to Egypt and free the Israelites from slavery. And after at least five different excuses that he's the wrong guy, eventually Moses gets on the same page with God. And after a few decades of wandering in the desert, God called Moses to a huge mission. He went back to Egypt but you, most of you know the story, Pharaoh didn't listen. And so God used Moses to unleash 10 plagues. And finally, Pharaoh relents and says, go, take your people and get out of here. Try to imagine over 2 million people leaving town at once. It's madness. This is a mass exodus, and they are now going to be free from slavery and oppression. However, as the Israelites are leaving town, Pharaoh is coming back. He's coming back after them. And as the Egyptians are chasing them, how will the Israelites respond? Will they trust God's plan or will they panic? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be camped in Exodus 14. We're going to start out in verse 10. It's going to be up on the screen as well. Exodus 14, 10 through 12 here. I'm going to read. This is the New Living Translation. It says, as Pharaoh approached... The people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. I see the Israelites do two things in this passage. Number one, they panicked. And number two, they complained. When valleys hit in our life, provoked or unprovoked, it's easy to panic and complain. I think that's human nature. Christian Bovey said, panic is a sudden desertion of us and a going over to the enemy of our imagination. My wife and I laugh about how she can be a doomsday thinker sometimes. We, uh, we're at the beach and we could be eaten by sharks. We're running to the car in the rain and we could be struck by lightning. We're in a, swimming in a lake and we might get the brain-eating amoeba. You get the picture. Maybe you can relate to that, especially all you Enneagram sixes out there. The reality is we so often let our imaginations and what ifs take over. What if it's cancer? What if I can't get a job? What if we can't pay our rent? What if my kids don't make good friends? And the enemy wants us to play that game over and over and over and steal our peace. Lisa Turker said, what makes faith fall apart isn't doubt. It's being too certain of the wrong things. So what are the wrong things that we get certain of in the valleys? A few of them are the lies of the enemy, letting fear paralyze you, thinking that this season will never end, thinking that I'm alone in this, having thoughts that I have no hope. Jesus referred to the enemy as the father of lies. You see, lying is what he does. He wants you to have fear and rob you of peace. He wants you to believe you are going to be in this season the rest of your life. 
He wants you to believe that you are alone and that you have no one that understands. He wants to make you think you have no hope. He not only lies, but he will give you half-truths to create confusion. Jesus says this in John 8, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. The truth is Satan was defeated at the cross. That's what's true. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, Paul describes the defeat over the enemy in a victorious way. Paul says this, you were dead because of your sins. And because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The victory belongs to Jesus, and we get to share in that victory as children of God. Let that sink in for a minute. We are victorious in Christ. Our sin is forgiven. We have hope that is only found in Jesus. There's nothing that we can ever do to earn it, to deserve it, but it's the overwhelming love of Jesus Christ to you and to me. That's who our God is. And that is truth that we have in God's word. You see, God is still at work and our story is not over. Your story is not over. And knowing this truth, the enemy does what he does best. He lies and he twists the truth. And even though he can't change what Jesus did on the cross, he can absolutely lie to us in an attempt to keep us from fulfilling our God-given purpose and rob us of peace. When I was in student ministry, I took a group of students to Big Stuff Camp. I don't know if you (laughs) probably did that too, Rob. And uh, it was in Panama City, Florida. And so I had two vans, two minivans in our caravan, and we drove down to Atlanta Christian College because I wanted to save a little money, so we stayed at Atlanta Christian College. And uh, on the way there, I got lost. And uh, this was back in the day before your phone had, like, GPS maps, the old map quest, right? You print out map, qu- map quest, and the directions were right there. Anyway, I'm using those, and I get lost. I'm in Atlanta, so I pull over at a gas station, and I quickly realize this is not a stop that I want everybody getting out. So I go and tell all the vans, hey, listen, let's stay in. I'll find out where we're at. We need to gas up. So I gas up. I see a guy peeing on the wall. I'm like, yep, this is not a good spot for us to get out at. So I'm, I gas up. I then walk to go get directions, And a guy comes up to me asking me for money. And when I hesitated to pull out my wallet, he pulled out a knife. And all of a sudden, I was in panic mode. I pulled out my wallet as fast as I could, and I had a $100 bill in there for trip emergencies. You could say this was a trip (laughs) emergency. So I, I gave him a crisp $100 bill. He took it, took off, and so did we. Okay, we got out of there as fast as we could. And it's amazing how you forget about everything else when fear for your life and others come over you. And this is what the enemy wants to do in our life. He wants to rob us of peace. The enemy wants to rob us of joy. I saw a great shirt a friend of mine had on the other day, and it said, not today, Satan. And it might sound cheesy, but I love that. We need to stand up to the enemy and say, not today, Satan. Stephen Furtick says, God's great love is the reality that towers three feet above fear and says, you mess with him, you mess with me. And that's what God does to fear. He kicks it out of our hearts and his peace and love dwells instead. We have to move our thoughts to God's truth. And that is what sets us free from worry and fear. Not today, Satan. You have no power over me. 
Let us remember who our God is. He is greater than your fears. He is bigger than your worries. John Acuff said, fear is a feeling. Afraid is a choice. When fear shows up, I feel it fully, but then I have the choice to stay in it or choose hope. Some days I have to choose it 1,000 times. Let me say that again. Fear is a feeling. Afraid is a choice. In the valleys, we tend to only see the obstacles in front of us and panic. Something that we need to focus on is the truth of God's word. Focus on his promises for our lives. Focus on our incredible God who is fighting our battles. And like John said, some days we have to choose it a thousand times. Remember that you don't have to have everything figured out right now. You don't have to have all the answers. And I I know when I am in my valley, to know that is really comforting. Because so often I want to have everything figured out. I want to know when the end is near I want to have the answers, but sometimes we just need to understand we might not have all the answers. You don't have to feel alone because you're not alone. God is encouraging you to focus your attention on him and not your circumstances or the obstacles in front of you. So let's pick back up and check out what happens in Exodus 14, 13 and 14. It says, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I love that sentence. Just stay calm. It's three words that can be life-changing for us. So let's say that together. Just stay calm. You ready? Just stay calm. Louder. Let's go. Just stay calm. The people looked around, saw their escape blocked by the Red Sea. They saw the Egyptian army coming in hot after them. They yelled at Moses, how could you do this to us? We were better off in Egypt. And Moses saw the chaos around them, the people yelling at him. And he told the people, just stay calm. What about your life right now? Everything in me wants to make a way out of the valley as fast as possible while panicking and complaining all the way through. I didn't deserve this. Why did this happen? God, how could you? This isn't fair. And God tells us to stop and stay calm. He says, I've got this. There is a condition to God fighting our battles. He tells us to stay calm while he fights. While we rest, he carries the weight of those heavy feelings. If you want peace in your life, it means that you'll have to trust that God is more than capable of taking on your circumstances, taking on the weight that you feel, all of the things that are going on. God says, trust me. Let me carry it. Let me take it. And if you believe God is the God of the mountain, then believe he is the same God in the valleys. And maybe that's a phrase you need to hear today or to say this phrase to yourself over and over or put it on your phone that just pops up and it's this reminder that says, stay calm, God's got this. God's got this. He wants to fight our battles. Yet in the valleys, it's easy to forget that God is beside us. We tend to try to take everything on ourselves. And when we look at our circumstances today, we have a choice. We can panic, we can complain, or we can stay calm and trust that God is at work. There might be a great work God is doing in our lives, even when it seems the darkest. Or like we have nowhere to run and everything seems blocked. There's no way. There's no way. But God says, trust me. You see, the Israelites had the Red Sea blocking their escape. And the Egyptians were coming after them. And it looked like there was no escape. And after Moses told the people to stay calm and reminded them that God is fighting for them, he does this in Exodus 14, 21 and 22. 
Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. You know, sometimes in our valleys, we don't need instructions, but we need a reminder. You see, what an incredible deliverance the people of Israel received that day. God was working on their behalf all night. They didn't cross the sea in mud, but on dry ground. He made a pathway to deliverance through the night. When it was dark, God was working all night on their behalf. Can you imagine crossing to the other side, seeing a wall of water? And if it were to come down, it would mean certain death. But let us be reminded today that God loves you and he's fighting for you. Let that sink in. That's one thing we can be certain of. God is fighting for you. As I journeyed through the valleys of losing my dad, battling through concussions, health issues, transitioning my family, church hurt, unemployment, I felt lost. Lost in grief, lost in disappointment, lost in discouragement, lost in waves of depression, lost in anger. Sadness would come over me suddenly at random times. And in this valley, I felt lost with no sense of direction. And I wondered if I would have to stay in this valley forever. And in those times, it's easy to listen to the voice of discouragement. It's easy to listen to the lies of the enemy. And so I, I got coffee with a friend and mentor, and, and I just shared with him everything that was going on and, and how I was feeling. And, and I remember him saying that your valley is not your destination. And it was so good to hear that. He then said, you will get through this, but you have to walk through it or you'll get lost in it. He asked me this question, what voice are you listening to? And, and I want to ask all of you, what voice are you listening to? What, what voices have you been listening to most? And if I was honest, I, I was listening to the voice of negativity. And I had to get back into God's word and be reminded of who God is, to be reminded of his faithfulness, that he's been faithful in my past, and I know that he's going to continue to be faithful, and not only in my present, but in my future. And so the verse that I really grabbed a hold of right after that time with him was Psalm 23. And I want to read this to us. And maybe right now you just, you just need to close your eyes and maybe you just need to take this in. Or, or maybe you just need to open up your Bible and you need to dive in. Maybe there's something you need to highlight. But Psalms 23, it says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. The valley is full of darkness, but we have a shepherd who never leaves us. We have a good shepherd named Jesus who doesn't want us to get lost in the valley, but to listen to his voice and follow him. He wants to walk with you through every moment, every disappointment, every mistake, every hurt, every joy, and every valley. He knows your deepest thoughts and worries. And he is a God that cares about the details of our lives and wants to work them out for our good. Years ago, some Native American tribes had a rite of passage. And when a boy reached the age of 13... The boy was blindfolded, led out into the woods, and left to spend the night alone. His courage would be proven if he could sit and listen to the frightening sounds of the night without removing the blindfold. 
And when he felt the warmth of the morning sun, he was allowed to remove the blindfold to find that his father was just sitting a few feet away. Unknown to the boy, his father had been by his side throughout the night, watching over him and protecting him from any real danger. And that's our heavenly dad too. He's right beside you. He sees you in whatever circumstance you are in right now. And we are not meant to stay put in our valleys, but we are meant to walk through them. And I'm so grateful that I wasn't alone, that I had a good shepherd named Jesus who was with me every step of the way, even in moments when I didn't feel him, when he didn't respond, he was there. And friends, maybe some of you in this room or watching online, you need to hear this. Don't give up. God is with you. This season will not be forever. We have an amazing God. And it's a testimony that I'm on this stage here before you today. It's only through the faithfulness of God. And so, friends, may we be encouraged that our God walks with us and we are never alone. Let me pray. God, thank you for who you are, for your goodness and your mercy, and they follow us all the days of our lives. And God, some of us in this room might be walking through some dark valleys in life right now. We might have been walking through a lot of dark valleys, and maybe some of us feel alone. God, I pray through your Holy Spirit, through your word, that we know without a doubt, God, that you're with us, you're encouraging us right now, that you're gonna use all that we've gone through and been through for good, that you're gonna see good come from it and that we can be uh, sharing our own testimony to others and to give others hope even when they're walking through valleys. But God, may we run to you May we listen to your voice. God, thank you for your love, for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.